this place, 600 years ago, a body was exhumed. The dig was done in secrecy, the site roped off and screened from public view. Twenty feet down, the bones of an exceptionally big man were found in a hollowed out tree trunk. His head had been smashed by a terrible blow. Nearby, excavators claimed they had unearthed a lead cross. Its inscription read, Here lies the famous King Arthur, buried in the Isle of Avalon. Knights of the Round Table, Guinevere and Lancelot, Excalibur. There are no more evocative names in the British story. And yet, like the claim that Glastonbury was Avalon and Arthur buried here, they are the inventions of medieval romancers. Glastonbury today is the centre of an Arthurian knick-knack industry, and yet the first connection of Arthur with this place occurs in a saint's life written around the year 1150, that is well over 600 years after he is supposed to have flourished. And the greatest medieval expert, the historian William of Malmesbury, makes no such connection. Indeed, he specifically denies that Arthur's burial place was known. For this reason, although we shall try to place the Arthur story in history, in this film, we shall not be looking at the Glastonbury romances of Arthur, we shall not be going to Tintagel, the Round Table at Winchester, or Camelot, because none of these fictions can be used by the historian to reconstruct the past. They are hero stories, myths, no more. If we wish to uncover real historical events behind the Arthur story, then we must do as William of Malmesbury urged us all those years ago, that is, throw out such dubious matter and gird ourselves for a straight, factual narrative. The question is, what happened in Britain after the fall of the Roman Empire? And bound up with that, inextricably now it seems, a second question. Was there really, at this time, a great war leader called Arthur? Walk into any bookshop, Foils of London for instance, and look at the books on the shelves and you'll soon be left in no doubt at all that Arthur existed and that he played a central role in British history. The books range from the serious academic to what one might call the nutty fringe. And in them, Arthur appears as everything from culture hero to freedom fighter, a dark age Superman or a dark age Che Guevara. Today there is wide agreement that he did exist and that he was a Roman generalissimo with a wide-ranging brief to hold back the Anglo-Saxon hordes who invaded Britain in the period when Roman power here began to ebb. Porchester on the south coast of England. This massive Roman fortress, the best preserved in northern Europe, was one of a dozen built around the year 300 to defend these shores against Anglo-Saxon invaders. The society it protected was already under stress, with class division, the decline of towns and trade, the growth of great private rural estates, high inflation and the gradual abandonment of a money economy. In 410, the Roman regular units were pulled out of Britain after 350 years. As their galleys edged into the Solent, they left behind them a still wealthy island. But by the mid-century, the city councils had given way to dictatorship, 
and this new government invited in Anglo-Saxon mercenaries to protect itself against both internal and external rivals. Catastrophe followed. Floods of impoverished but warlike immigrants came from Germany and Denmark, the ancestors of today's English, to take part in a Dark Age gold rush. In the end, Roman Britain sank without trace. In recent years, archaeologists have shown that at the crisis of these events, around 500, when King Arthur is alleged to have led the British defence against the invaders, the Anglo-Saxons had settled in considerable numbers in Lincolnshire, East Anglia, Kent, parts of Sussex and in the Thames Valley. But from this point, there is no more information about the rich, urban and rural life of Roman Britain. Archaeologists are trying to find out whether such life continued. Does the desperate rearguard action of Arthurian legend mask the true transformation in these islands? How did the present England and Wales emerge from the ruins of Roman Britain? Roxeter Roman city near Shrewsbury. This great town with its two-mile circuit of walls was abandoned sometime between 400 and 600 and unlike most Roman cities, did not become a modern town. It now lies under farmland and is being painstakingly excavated, stripped off layer by layer. It is perhaps the archaeologist's best hope of penetrating to the mysterious end of Roman Britain. They're down now to the last phase, the city that existed at the fall of Rome and which may have lasted into the Arthurian period. Phil Barker is excavating the area of the Basilica Hall of the Bathhouse, a huge building the size of a cathedral nave, which went out of use around 300. After that came a remarkable sequence of structures, very different in character from this elegant complex which existed in the heyday of Roman Britain. I think you must envisage uh, this great building, after it had gone out of use, uh, being demolished part by part with its walls still being used uh, as the back walls of buildings built inside it. But in the centre there was a hodgepodge of buildings which we haven't really got down to yet, made of wattle and daub, uh, posts cut into the floor of the basilica, buildings which were only beginning to see fragmentarily, but they were certainly uh, rather like the squalid occupation which is said to be the end of Roman Britain. They were not very pretentious and this makes the final phase all the more exciting and all the more uh, unexpected. The whole lot was cleared in one go and a complete new city centre was planned. Not only was it planned but it was executed in timber and this I think is one of the reasons why all the previous excavations of this site have missed it because they've been they've going straight down to the floor of the stone basilica. Now uh, the central building of this great new development was a winged house slap on the middle of the nave and the north aisle of the basilica with a portico which stood on two fragments of the old basilica's columns. It was about 100 and something feet long, about 30 odd meters long. On the other side of that we have absolutely clear evidence of a, a row of buildings with their narrow fronts to the street with facades, again of timber, which included uh, porticos with double columns and flights of wooden steps up to verandas. And the, the whole picture which is beginning to emerge is rather like colonial American town. They were quite obviously Romano-British people who were attempting to either continue or to revive on this spot uh, a, a classical world but 
in materials which were very different from those which had been used during the heyday of the city. Have you any, uh, any evidence at all for the, for the dating of the last plague? Well, that's a $64,000 question because we don't know yet, because we haven't really got down to it, the date of the destruction of the basilica. But previous excavators have thought it went out of use about 300. Well, after that, we have a long sequence of buildings which I really don't think can reasonably be compressed within 100 years. The latest object from the site, but not from our site, but from the city, is the tombstone of a man called Cunorix. Cunorix Macus Machicolini, uh, which translated is Hound King, son of the son of the Holly. Now, he's supposed to be an Irishman, although this is, uh, so you tell me, disputed, who died here sometime between 450 and 500 and was sufficiently important to have a Latin tombstone carved for him, however crudely. It would be very nice indeed if we knew the relationship between Cunorix and these buildings. Was his boss living here? Or did he live here? Did he live in one of these facaded buildings? Mm. Was he an Irishman uh, who came over and found himself faced with uh, the last flickering of the classical uh, style before Inigo Jones and Wren? These are so questions which I'm afraid we shall never answer, but they're extremely tantalizing. Whenever the city was abandoned, it was never repopulated. The later Anglo-Saxon settlers formed a tiny village which is still there around the church. And the church itself is built out of the massive foundation stones of the basilica, still showing the Lewis holes of the Roman masons. Its gate flanked by classical columns. By now, the Roman order has given way to a new world. Sirencester, capital of the Cotswolds. In Roman times, Sirencester was second only to London in size. A wealthy market for the villa life of the Cotswolds, it had luxurious buildings and a two and a half mile circuit of walls. The place became an Anglo-Saxon centre and is a thriving town today. But what happened after Rome? The citizens certainly kept up organised life for a while. They kept the flagstones of the piazza in the forum swept clean, here where their modern successors parked their cars. They restored the defences on this site, the Verulamium Gate. They made home improvements in the recently discovered House of the Hare Mosaic, installing a new heating system at a time when we might have expected less domestic preoccupations. But the end is a mystery for which only shadowy clues have been found in the grass-grown amphitheatre. Alan McQuirr, Director of Excavations. Just inside the entrance of the amphitheatre, there was a late gravelled surface which contained substantial timber post holes, which we think may have been associated with some form of late occupation. As well as that, the uh, entrance was reduced in size. Now, we don't really know what happened, but perhaps with the declining population in the town, the people may have retreated to the amphitheatre, a smaller population, to an easily defendable area, much easier to defend this amphitheatre than two and a half miles of the town wall, and were living in these timber huts. And now, there is a little bit of pottery associated with these huts. It's this grass-tempered pottery, which may be fifth or sixth century in date. So it is possible, but I stress only possible, that the dwindling population of Sirencester may have retreated into the amphitheatre. If Sirencester survived after the Arthurian period, it may have been no more than an impoverished rural community, a couple of farms within decaying Roman walls, perhaps decimated by the great plague which swept the Roman world in the 440s. By that time, these beautiful and intricate mosaics, now in the Carinium Museum in Sirencester, were valueless. A symbol of Roman luxury, surplus wealth, and upper-class status this Orpheus mosaic had been made by one of the major mosaic workshops of the Western Empire, based in Sirencester itself. But when the Anglo-Saxons finally took the town in 577, they cared nothing for it and cut right through it to bury this warrior, the first known English inhabitant of Sirencester.
This student from the Institute of Archaeology in London is counting plant species. On average, a new species roots itself in a hedgerow every century. Find a hedgerow with 15 species and you may have a late Roman field boundary. If the boundaries are the same as the later Anglo-Saxon ones, then you may have continuity between the Roman estates and the medieval. So did the rural fabric carry on when the cities died? Here at Withington, in the Cotswolds above Sirencester, was one villa estate in the wealthiest society in Britain. Richard Rees of the Institute of Archaeology has been examining this estate to discover exactly what happened when the English settled here. Whether the warfare of Arthurian legend does not disguise a real story of peaceful assimilation, his findings, which are now paralleled elsewhere in the Cotswolds, suggest that the life of the Roman estates may never have been shattered. Well, well, in many parts of the empire, when a new set of people actually come into an area, you do get a friendly settlement uh, whereby part of the land is given over to the incoming people and part is kept for the old aristocracy or the landowners or whatever. And if we take the, the thing that Bede wrote about the Saxons being given places to live in between the people who are already living there, the Romans or Celts or call them what you will, then you could have build up the picture of the Romans staying put in their well-working estates and having the Saxons spread around on the marginal land, up on the hilltops and so on. I'd almost start off with an assumption of continuity. This is rather the other way, the opposite way to what people think at the moment. But if you take a tract of countryside like this round here, then the most obvious thing to me is that it's being used and managed. And if you can rear good sheep and cattle, get good crops of wool, um, get good arable crops down in the valley, then somebody is going to keep on doing, the, doing it and, and living off the proceeds. Who is actually owning the thing? Who is actually getting the, um, the kudos for being the lord of the manor or whatever you want to call it? Uh, I don't think it's such an important problem. In 350, I'm fairly sure that it's somebody with a Roman name probably living in what we call a Roman villa. In 750, in this particular place, we know that the, um, that the monastery was the lord of the manor. This had been given to uh, the abbess who looked after the monastery from the proceeds of a working estate. You seem to imply that the late Roman period was perhaps a bigger turning point in, in this landscape than the Anglo-Saxon settlement. Is that how you'd sum it all up? I'm very glad that I implied that, yes. That's, that, that's what I tend to think. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the turning point in Britain comes in about 300 AD, um, which for most people is bang in the middle of something they've learnt of as a, a perfectly normal period, which started and finished in the same way. I would say it started in one way and finished in a totally different way. And the way that Roman Britain finished was pretty well the same way as medieval Britain began. As the cities declined, many of the warlords went back to the hills, renovating the Iron Age hill forts which had been abandoned when the Romans first came to Britain. These massively defended citadels were easier to man than miles of city walls, but they also suggest an atmosphere of retreat and fear. This is the background modern historians have seen as Arthur's. In the period when Anglo-Saxon mercenaries spread their revolt over the south of Britain, when warlords and dictators, popular fronts and national liberation fronts fought each other and the invaders for political control. At this site, the archaeologists had a spectacular triumph, Cadbury Castle in Somerset. A tradition had it that Cadbury was the site of King Arthur's legendary palace, Camelot. The sorts itself, as it happens, is worthless. It dates from the 16th century. But these traditions sometimes have a knack of proving right. And when the Camelot Research Committee dug here, they found that this vast fortress had been re-fortified with a dry stone wall along here, with palisades, towers, and a gateway in the late 5th century. 
and out there in the middle they found the traces of a great feasting hall of a Dark Age warlord. Was that warlord Arthur? And had they indeed discovered Camelot? Camelot, in fact, is the invention of a 12th century French romancer, and therefore of no value to the archaeologist save as a symbol. And nor was anything turned up to connect the place specifically with King Arthur. What the dig here did prove was that in the 5th century, someone was strong enough to wall this place, erect buildings, build gates, someone whose retinue was large enough to need a 15-acre site, someone who built in a hybrid Roman-British style, hangover of the great days of the Roman army in Britain. And Arthur? At the time, it was thought that Cabri was unique and must have been the fortress of the chief resistance leader. Now we know that many other hill forts were reoccupied and refortified at this time. Congressbury. Cannington. Old Sarah. Yarnbury, on the highest point of Salisbury Plain between Warminster and Andover. Sisbury, on the Downs above the Sussex coast. Amesbury in Wiltshire, its fort now invisible beneath dense woods, but a fortress of the Romano-British general Ambrosius, who won battles against the Anglo-Saxons around the 470s. The significance of these reoccupations cannot yet be fully understood. For instance, do they represent central control of a dictator, or a generalissimo like Ambrosius, or are they local responses to local conditions? These forts were manned to meet a particular situation, a protracted war with the Anglo-Saxons, culminating around 500 in the great event of the era, the Siege of Mount Baden. To the Britons, Baden was the Alamein of their day, and later writers claimed King Arthur had led their army. Like other battles of the time, it was obviously at one of these hill forts, but which one? There are many theories. Recently, historians have looked for Baden at Bath, as medieval writers did, claiming that the English name, Bathan, is from the Celtic Badham, but philologists deny such a connection. Certainly the Iron Age hill fort above the city at Little Salisbury is an impressive isolated mount, as the name implies. But excavation has found no trace of post-Roman occupation here, perhaps because Bath nearby was still lived in. And it may also be doubted that the Anglo-Saxon invaders could have penetrated this far west before 500. Bradbury Hill Fort near Farringdon in Oxfordshire is another possibility for Baden. It's now levelled and under plantation, although its ring can still be clearly seen from the air. It is in the right kind of area, one of several English Badbury's which philologists now say could have come from a British Baden. But this is hardly a Mons, a separate pronounced hill as our sources require. But there is a third claimant for Mount Baden. Liddington Castle, a prominent Iron Age hill fort on the downs above Swindon, a landmark dominating the approaches to Sirencester and the Cotswolds. In Anglo-Saxon times, 
This place bore the English name Badenburg, which could have derived from a Celtic Badon. Liddington Castle stands over one of the great Dark Age road junctions. Just the other side of the fort, the Ermine Way, the Roman road, runs down to the southeast of England, and over there joins a Roman road running directly south. And the Great Ridgeway itself, the Iron Age trackway, which runs across England into the heart of Wessex, comes over Ashdown and runs here right underneath the lip of the fort, a sort of Dark Age spaghetti junction. And in the logic of great travel routes, the modern motorway planners have built the M4 also right underneath Liddington. But there's another reason why we should look for Mount Baden somewhere in this area. Let's look at this map. You can see where we are. Uh, London over here, Oxford, the Midlands, Swindon, Bristol, Cheltenham and Gloucester. Now the main areas controlled by the Britons at this period were dependent upon the old Roman cities of Gloucester, Cirencester, and Bath. The main Anglo-Saxon settlements were heavily concentrated around the Upper Thames below Oxford. If there is a, a war zone between the two, then Liddington ran right on it. There is a final point. Recently, an excavation was done on the top here, and it was discovered that the fort had been reoccupied and refortified at exactly this time. Indeed, imported pottery was discovered here. So although we can't be sure, everything does seem to fit. And if this was Mount Baden, then this is where history and tradition meet. Because according to our later sources, the leader at this great battle, the last victory of the fatherland, was King Arthur. Was it here then that Arthur fought, as modern writers have conjectured, like a latter-day Roman cavalry general, his troops heavily armoured like late Roman mounted troops? Prototypes of the Knights of the Round Table. Was it here, as Geoffrey of Monmouth had it, that Arthur climbed the hill as day dawned and vanquished the Saxons in hand-to-hand -hand conflict? To answer that, we must go to the core of the Arthurian story, the earliest of all Arthurian references in the Annals of Wales and in the history of the Britons, contained in a manuscript in the British Library, housed in the British Museum. The root of the whole question lies here, in this one book. Is there any historical truth at all behind the legends? The manuscript is simply known as Harley 3859. In fact, it's a, a great miscellany of Latin writings, and all that concerns us uh, are the folios between 174 and 198, the Welsh annals, the history, and the Welsh genealogies. It is not known yet where this book was written, but it was probably written not by a Welshman, but by an Anglo-Norman in the early years of the 12th century, that is, the early 1100s. But the annals themselves go back a long way before that. They begin in the mid-5th century, but only from the late 8th century, let's say about the year 800, are they a contemporary record. And this is really vital for understanding the Arthurian problem, because the annals that concern Arthur are from before that time. In other words, they are not a contemporary record. If we look at them, on folio 190, first dating here, 518, but perhaps in the 490s, the Battle of Baden. Bellum Badonis in quo Arthur portavit crucem domini nostri Jesu Christi. The Battle of Baden, in which Arthur carried the cross of Jesus Christ on his shoulders for three days and three nights, and the Britons were victorious. Now, the monk who wrote that annal about the Battle of Baden uh, had not just got the news from a, a dust-streaked messenger hot foot from Arthur's HQ. This is a later scholar's construction on the events. They are not primary sources. Now that to a historian is crucial because it throws great suspicion on the content of the annal. And if we look at the content of the annal, then that feeling is sustained. Most of these annals, as you can see, are very brief and laconic. The death of somebody, the battle at somewhere. But 
Here, the Baden Annal has been expanded with what are obviously romantic elements. It's most likely that this annal originally read simply the Battle of Baden or something like that. And at a later point in the transmission of the text, the romantic details were added when the legend of Arthur was already snowballing. Why this should have been done and why that should have been added is best explained by turning to the Historia. This is the most famous piece of Arthuriana of them all, written 829 or 830. It's not thought that the author had any good source for 5th or 6th century history, but he did include the famous list of the 12 battles of Arthur, uh, most of them quite incomprehensible today, Bassas, uh, Dubglas, Gwynion, and so on. These battle lists are not uncommon in Welsh literature, and uh, there is a tendency in them for the authors to ascribe to their heroes battles in which they never fought. And that certainly seems to be the case with one or two of them here. And I would say also in the account of Mount Baden, where, which is laced with romantic detail. 960 men, it says, fell in one charge, and no one killed them but Arthur himself. This is pure myth. There is no evidence for Arthur's connection with Baden. Indeed, he may never have existed at all. But where did the Arthur story come from? The names in the British Library battle list and in the early Welsh poetry all point not to Tintagel, Glastonbury and the southwest, but to Cumbria and the ancient kingdom of Regeth around the western end of Hadrian's Wall. The Battle of the Caledonian Forest in particular can only have been fought here, north of Carlisle. So was the real background to the Arthur story not the English invasions at all, but the warfare of the Britons with the Scots and Picts? High Rochester, on Deer Street, north of Hadrian's Wall, the deserted and overgrown Roman fort of Bramanium, on the borders of the ancient kingdom of Rege its Roman walls and gates still showing through the banks of the enclosure. Here was another battle in the Arthurian list, at a windswept frontier fort abandoned by the Romans over a century before Arthur's day. Today the square of the fort is a farmyard with cottage and barns, its artillery platforms pig pens, its outside ditches still visible perhaps not so different from what a 6th century traveller might have seen. The battle fought here was famous in northern poetry, but it was fought not by Arthur, but 50 years after his time. In 500, the Anglo-Saxons were nowhere near here. Yevering on the River Glen in Northumberland, the crop marks on this air photograph led archaeologists to a Celtic centre taken over by the Anglo-Saxons. Was this the site of the battle on the River Glen in the Arthurian list? If so, the enemy was not English, for they were not here for another 50 years. Where was the centre from which these British armies fought in the early 500s? The chief Roman city had been Carlisle, and a massive redevelopment here has enabled archaeologists to examine a five-acre site in the city centre. They started only recently, and despite the pressures of the developers and the great size of the site, no stone is left unmapped as the layers of Carlisle's past are stripped off. Victorian tenements, medieval alleys, Roman townhouses. A city excavation of so large an area is a rarity, and it gives a real chance of finding answers to the vexed question of what happened here after Rome. Already it is known that urban life here continued after 400, with Roman buildings maintained and some rebuilt substantially in timber. The roads remained in use in the 6th century and possibly all the way through, and the aqueduct still worked in the 7th century. Mike McCarthy is director of excavations here. I would see Carlisle in the sub-Roman period, perhaps in the 5th and the, the, the 6th centuries, as changing its character from being um, a Roman town um, uh, with an economy which was perhaps based very largely on the hinterland here, an agricultural economy, changing perhaps into more of a, an ecclesiastical and perhaps a royal um, uh, centre of a state, something of that kind, with, with the royal and the ecclesiastical element perhaps taking precedence over the purely urban functions that were here before. And that if that 
kind of idea is um, acceptable, then we may see the transition from the uh, late Roman period into the post-Roman period um, with respect to local authorities' powers, as perhaps the, the, uh, the members of the local town council in, the, in late Roman Carlisle are simply assuming the functions and gradually changing into, metamorphosing as it were, into uh, a nobility and an, and an aristocracy with perhaps the leading members of that gradually emerging into a, a royal family, a princely family, something of that kind. Carlyle reminds us that the Roman Empire did not fall at one moment in history, and that a kind of Roman life may have lasted here a century longer than at Roxeter. In this border region in the Dark Ages, several British tribal rulers claimed Roman descent in their family trees, perhaps delegated power by the last Roman governments. Could the background to the Arthur story then be these petty chiefs who made their squalid timber camelots in towns like Carlisle? One last piece of evidence might point that way. We've left to the last a battle which has no place in the Historia's list, the battle in the annals at Camlan in which Arthur and Medrote were killed. Experts in the old Welsh language uh, feel that the word Camlan could be a late form of the Roman name for the fort on Hadrian's Wall at Bird Oswald, east of Carlisle, which was called Camboglana, the Crooked Glen, referring to the great sweep of the river Irthing through its gorge underneath the fort. Now again, this annal is by no means contemporary, but in this case, it might be rash to say that no battle of Camlan ever took place, because in later Welsh poetry, the battle becomes a byword for a terrible, irretrievable disaster. Could this then be the one genuine Arthurian reference, the real, last, dim, weird battle of the West? And was Arthur himself, perhaps, a chieftain from the Northwest? It is possible. But if he was, then at that time, his warfare was not heroic warfare against invading Anglo-Saxons, but a desperate dogfight between rival dynasties fighting it out in the sub-Roman twilight. Was it then the deaths of two obscure leaders of unknown tribes in this wild spot which gave birth to the whole extraordinary story? Gave birth to one of the greatest figures in the literature of the world, to the supernatural hero of the Middle Ages. Yet some men say King Arthur is not dead, but had by the will of our Lord Jesus into another place. And men say he shall come again and shall win the Holy Cross. I will not say it shall be so, but many men say there is written on his tomb this verse. Here lies Arthur, once king and king in the future. We asked two questions at the start of this film. The first, what happened in Britain after the fall of the Roman Empire, cannot yet be answered, although a new picture of continuity is starting to emerge, very different from that put forward only a few years ago. But with the second question, there is a measure of certainty. There is no good historical evidence that King Arthur ever existed. However, it is possible that in that late reference to a battle here, by the crooked glen at the Roman fort on the wall lies the germ of all those later riches. The point is that after these events, Celtic Britain sank into its dark age and faced with the rising aggressive power of the Anglo-Saxon kings, Offa, Alfred and Athelstan, the British needed a hero. It didn't matter whether there was any truth behind his story. It calls to mind the end of John Ford's film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, when the newspaper editor says, if the fact becomes a legend, print the legend. And with Arthur, the Celts printed the legend.